Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, yes, politicians. All will be one to one. Today's guest is an educator, feminist, political activist, and one time fugitive. She had the dubious distinction of being on the FBI's most wanted list. Kathy Wilkerson tells her story for the first time in Flying Close to the Sun, My Life and Times as a Weatherman, which has just been published by Seven Stories Press. Here's how it opens. On the morning of March 6, 1970, in the sub-basement of 18 West 11th Street in Greenwich Village, a piece of ordinary water pipe filled with dynamite, nails, and electric blasting cap ignited by mistake. The townhouse belonging to her father and stepmother on that beautiful Greenwich Village block was obliterated. Three of Kathy's friends were killed. Today, we'll explore the times and feelings that led to that act and her life since then. Welcome, Kathy Wilkerson. Thank you. You had a pretty privileged upbringing. Uh, private schools, you're raised a Quaker. What role did uh, being raised as a Quaker play in your developing social consciousness? Well, actually, I think most, or at least uh, the foundation of my consciousness was laid before all that happened. I went to elementary and uh, part of middle school in the local public school in Connecticut. Um, and it wasn't until I was in sixth or seventh grade that my mother got a job teaching in a private school. And so she moved all of us over there. And at the same time, she switched from the Episcopalians to the Quakers. So it was in those kind of formative middle years that I began to be exposed to the Quaker uh, philosophy, although really I didn't understand very much about it until I went to a Quaker camp while I was in high school. Uh, I never went as a camper, but I went as a counselor in training and then a counselor. And I was very um, impressed at that point by the Quakers' commitment to social activism, to a an agenda of peace and conflict resolution, peaceful conflict resolution but more that they took responsibility to weigh in on the big issues of the day, which of course at that time was the civil rights movement. They felt everybody had a responsibility to get involved. Yes. And then it was at Swarthmore that you were drawn into the student movement. What, what drew you into the student movement? Uh, student, other students. And uh, I had heard about the civil rights movement in high school up near Boston. But it, it was another planet from my reality, and I didn't know how to get to it. Uh, but once, as soon as I went to college, uh, my freshman year, one of the seniors had been working in the civil rights movement during the summers in the South. And so he organized trips uh, of students to go down to Cambridge, Maryland, to support the civil rights movement there, led by Gloria Richardson, uh, who were trying to integrate the stores in downtown Cambridge. And it was a a very southern atmosphere and I was really tremendously moved and inspired by Gloria Richardson and um, and she became like a uh, a role model for me. My sense is that SDS your involvement came later you had gone after college you went to work for a congressman uh, but you decided that politics was not the way to bring about change, and you joined SDS. T tell me about the pull that SDS had on young people at that time. Well, I had actually, while I was in college, uh, for one year, while I was still going to school, I worked at a community organizing project in Chester, Pennsylvania, organizing to for equality and equal access to city services, to jobs, um, and I got a really profound education in how unequal the playing field really was. Uh, but the SDS meetings on campus were high intellectual male activities, and so I was not, as a very naive female, able to really participate in those, and I didn't really go to very many meetings. Um, and it, and I thought in Congress, uh, and I went to work for a congressman after college because I thought 
by that time, the war had really emerged as a major issue, and I thought Congress maybe could help stop the war. But what I learned was that Congress doesn't lead on foreign policy. Congress follows on foreign policy. And if I wanted to be in the forefront, which, of course, being young, I wanted to be, um, it wasn't in Congress that I needed to be, but out on, in the community organizing people against the war. And SDS was one of the major, if not the major, organization doing that at that time. You described it, you know, throughout the book as sort of the organization for white middle class young people. That was their movement. That, that was their way of getting involved. Yes, I think that was certainly its origin and its very beginning. In the early 60s, they had aspirations to uh, have an impact on the Democratic Party, and that was influenced by the civil rights movement's focus on trying to get the federal government through the Democratic Party involved in protecting civil rights workers in the South. Um, and that had a big impact on early S S SDS people. I mean, SDS was really born from the civil rights movement. And the early leadership of SDS um, had mostly had re a relationship to the civil rights movement and was inspired by the young activists who stepped up in the late 50s and early 60s. So SDS was an attempt to bring that to the northern white student movement. And uh, yeah. So you went to work for SDS in Chicago. You were suddenly the editor of their newspaper. Um, and you describe that as sort of a dream job for you. Tell me about those. You were there for six months. Tell me about that period for you. Well, it was very exciting to be in Chicago in the national office of SDS. And uh, the newspaper came out every week and was um, distributed. We printed about 5,000 copies. And it went out to chapters all over the country. And so it meant that there was correspondence coming into the office from a whole range of people who I had never heard of and I got to learn about, um, both from people talking about the history of the labor movement in this country, uh, activists in Puerto Rico, um, uh, all kinds of uh, people from different chapters who wrote in about what was happening on their campuses. And there were very uh, important debates about where we should go and what we believed. So I learned a lot. But your parents were not too happy about, you know, they had raised you to be a nice middle class girl. You got your college, get your college degree to get married, pr probably hold a job as well. And here you were living, you know, sort of hand to mouth, working for this radical organization, uh, barely, ma not making much money. Um, I know your mother didn't respond too well to this, but how about your sisters? How about your father? Well, my mother was frightened. I mean, she was the first woman in her family to go to college. And for her, the fact that her daughters go to college was one of the most important goals. And she was a product, she was a, a young woman during the McCarthy era. And for her, if you're an activist, it would squelch your ability to work and to be an independent woman. So she was very terrified about that. And that kind of defined her reaction. My father, on the other hand, was a big believer, was in advertising and was a big believer in marketing and, uh, and progress in the United States, that progress, of course, made problems, but progress would cure the problems. So he was kind of uh, mystified by what my obsession with the problems was, and he thought I might miss out on all the fun in life if I focused only on the problems. And he didn't really understand um, or agree that there was not a level, a structurally there was not a level playing field. So he was uh, bemused and befuddled by it. Whereas my sisters had similar reactions to our growing up and to the times that I did. And they were socially conscious as well, but they just did it in a different way. Yes, they were involved in environmental and community issues all through the 60s. And um, I had a stepsister who worked at the GI coffee houses. So, um, What were the GI coffee houses? Well, at that time, um, we the draft was in effect. And so there were still people being drafted economically, like happens today, but they were also being drafted uh, by lottery. And so 
we realized that they needed to have support, that they were not the enemy. They were the people who were being forced to fight in this war. So uh, young people developed, um, set up coffee houses right outside the perimeter of a lot of the major basic training bases so that there would be a place for GIs to go when they were off duty that was not surrounded by the kind of military um, humdrum that the rest of their lives was filled with and where they could get support for their own opposition to the war. Now, as time went on, SDS became involved not just in organizing and protest, but in guerrilla theater, um, open confrontations with establishment figures, with the police. Um, how did you, I mean, and some, sometimes some violence, you know, uh, at least destruction of, of property. How did you justify in your mind engaging in this kind of activity, in violence? Well, again, the civil rights movement was our uh, touchstone on this, and the power of the nonviolent actions of the civil rights movement was very strong for all of us, and certainly for me. Um, so it was only gradually after we had been at this for a number of years, fighting for to extend civil rights in the North um, and to defend what had been what little had been won already, and also to oppose the war, that the government seemed its public position seemed to make a mockery of the movement and to trivialize us. And at that point, we, and we were by then seeing young children burning up in napalm, napalm at, on the TV at night. We were very aware of the violence on a daily level. And it, it compelled us to have a response that was more than just sitting uh, and protesting. We began to feel like we had to find ways to interfere with the war machine. And it started very mildly with things like the recruiters who would come on campus uh, recruiting for the war and not telling young men exactly what they were going to face over there, where we would get into arguments and occasionally people would knock the recruiting papers on the floor or knock the table over, but never in a way that physically threatened the recruiter. So it started with those kinds of things like, you have to deal with this anti-war position, and if we couldn't get a an official voice in the public forum, then we would try to interfere with the war machine as best we could. We're going to have to take a break. We'll be back in a minute. Meet the faces of influenza, groups who should be immunized every year. I have a chronic medical condition. Asthma. Six months to five years old. Pregnant during influenza season. Age 50 or older. Care for someone at risk. We live with a baby under six months old. The American Lung Association asks, are you one of the faces of influenza? See your health care provider about getting an influenza immunization. Vaccination is a safe and effective way to prevent influenza. Visit facesofinfluenza.org. Welcome back to One to One. With me is Kathy Wilkerson, author of Flying Close to the Sun, My Life and Times as a Weatherman. When the national organization of SDS started falling apart, in the late 60s, early 70s, and it morphed into the Weathermen, um, which was basically a Leninist uh, organization, party really, uh, bent on revolution instead of just social change. How did your life change then? Well, SDS had been a wide open kind of celebratory organization, even at the same time as it was very serious about its politics. It was a lot of fun. Anyone could join. Uh, the meetings were chaotic. Um, every position was represented. And it was completely incapable of uh, having a consistent policy other than one of opposition to war and racism. Um, so at the end, by 1969, it had gotten so big and it was so structurally inefficient that it did fall apart in the face of the political pressure to be more efficient, that the movement should be more effective. And I think many of us switched from being ultra-democratic to the other side of the tension to being ultra-efficient. And Leninism is, if nothing else, a very efficient approach to management. I mean, it's not unlike 
many corporate management strategies, um, philosophies. Now, its ultimate goal and beliefs obviously are different than corporations, but it is a hierarchical philosophy um, that uh, is focused on getting things done. And by that time, the war had been dragging on for almost 10 years. The casualties were enormous on both sides. The degradation of the environment in Vietnam was just terrifying with Agent Orange and Napalm. Um, and so we felt we needed an efficient organization to oppose it. For me, uh, I, I was drawn to that. I had both the desire to, for democracy and also the desire for efficiency. But I, after I joined Weatherman in late 69, I was not able to understand what their philosophy was, what their strategy was, but they were the most angry people around, and I was really angry and upset by the war, and so I was drawn to them on that basis. And you went from working, you know, sort of, as you said, wide open organizations to these small, secretive groups who sort of had their, had their own program sometimes, uh, apart from any kind of national structure, is that right? Yes, I mean, they, the, we were in uh, small, what we called collectives, and there was a national leadership who coordinated everything, and as a, and I was not in the leadership at that point, I was just a, a member, and I didn't know what the national strategy was and thought that I wasn't supposed to ask, because by that time we were very aware, aware that the FBI had not only infiltrated to gather information, but that they were using that information to manipulate political groups against each other and manipulate people within groups against each other and they were sending false mail, false notes, making false phone calls. That had happened to me. Somebody had said they were me and it instigated an entire feud within the, uh, between me and the women's movement. So basically the, the collectives, the secret collectives started their own actions, planning their own actions and when the bomb went off the collective that you were involved with in New York City was planning an attack on Fort Dix over in New Jersey. Um, what do you think of that scheme as you look back on it now? Well, we were, we were overwhelmed by the violence that was going on around us and felt that the political our political efforts had been ineffective. And so, like generations of people before us, that provoked us to consider the alternative that, well, okay, if might does make right, and the only way, and the people with the biggest guns in the world are the people who get to call the shots economically and socially about what happens, then we have to find a way to enjoin that struggle on a military front. Now, that was our reasoning at the time, and it made sense to me at the time. Um, Fred Hampton had just been killed, and I, who was a leader of the Chicago Black Panther Party, and the night that he was killed, I vowed to myself that I would do anything at this point to fight the government. So I made that choice. In retrospect, it's, it, the absurdity of it is overwhelming, and, and in the context of today's world, we can we have a much broader lens to look at the issue of violence and power, violence and social change, um, and violence as a uh, break. Uh, th what happens when democracy breaks down? After the bomb went off and you know three of your friends were killed, you were a fugitive for I think ten years. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting the way you described it um, was a kind. I mean, you moved around. A lot, but it seemed to be a kind of peaceful, fairly peaceful existence. And at some point, you got back into uh, you were working, you were involved in activist activities again, you had a daughter. Um, uh, aside from the fact that you couldn't reveal your, your true identity it was a sort of kind of regular kind of life, or was it? Well, that was true for the second part of the underground years, but not f for the first part, Weatherman was still in existence. And I was uh, and part of the organization during that time, so it was not peaceful or restful, um, and not a time when I had a lot of, as a woman, a lot of independent political agency. I was, because of the hierarchical nature of the organization, we had to accept 
uh, secrecy and except not knowing what the philosophy, what the strategy of the organization was on some level. And while it was still continued to protest, to take actions against uh, racism and against the war, I wasn't sure where it was all leading. It wasn't until the war ended and then Weatherman fell apart, really, after the war ended, because it didn't really have a reason to be, um, that the sort of more peaceful and thoughtful part of my underground years happened um, when I began to sort through, was this the best way to fight against the ongoing struggle for equality in this country? And I realized that being isolated made it very hard to participate in some of the more interesting conversations that were going on about how do you have equality in the context of diversity, which was a conversation raised in the 60s and at the end of the 60s, but which we were at the very beginning of happening because the, the touchstone always before had been the melting pot. And by the end of the 60s, uh, the black movement and the Native American movement, et cetera, had made clear that the melting pot only went but so far in terms of common agreement in democracy. But there was a lot more to political life than that. And so I was, I wanted to get back into participating in that conversation. You write that you are grateful that the experiences of your youth allowed you to develop a political consciousness. What do you regret most about those years? Well, I, I here's how I think about regret. <laughs> I feel like every day of my life I've woken up and I've tried to do the best thing that I could figure out to do uh, to make the world a more peaceful and equitable place. Now, if I hadn't done that, I would have regrets. But I did the best that I could do in the circumstances and with the knowledge and understanding that I had. And I have continued to grow and change over my life. So there's a great deal that obviously I realize in retrospect we did wrong. Um, but when I look at it, I understand why I couldn't have known how to do it any better at the time. So I don't describe it as regrets, but rather that I think it's critical to go back and look at both the wonderful strengths of what we did and I did, as well as the really devastating mistakes, and, and more our ignorance about these conversations, both about equity in terms of race and women, um, and about violence and social change, and really get into a rigorous conversation about well, what do we think about social change and how can you get the economic decisions that are being made for all of us now not, and that we have no access to? How can we get those decisions back in the public forum? Are you involved in any kinds of groups or any kind of activism now? Well, I go to the anti-war marches, um, but my work has really focused on the issue of children and of education, and so I consider myself to be very much of an activist, uh, working for equity and rigor and um, sensibleness in education. Today's young people are often criticized as being self-centered, uninterested in what's happening uh, in the rest of the world, um, passive. Do you find, have you found that that's true? I completely disagree with that. And I think it's not an accident that some people uh, sort of put out that position and that many of us then respond to that. But I, I have found young people to be aware on a level that's far beyond what we were aware of as young people really? in the 60s. That's interesting. But their issue is they were, they're so aware of the big problems that they f are not sure exactly, and they're not into running off with half-baked solutions. They're much more sophisticated. And they um, are looking for, they're trying to find ways to lead their lives so they don't participate in the worst of the inequity and oppression in the world. And they're looking for opportunities to change it, but they're wary because they understand what a sort of powerful series of forces that we're up against. Um, and I also think that there's activism around the country way beyond what there was when we were young people. 
But we had the advantage of feeling powerful because the civil rights movement had actually won some critical changes in the national conversation around race. Every school still had to fight for integration one by one, every town for equity and voting. But we understood that we had power um, as participants in that movement or supporters in that movement in a way that young people don't feel powerful today. And I think my generation still feels more powerful because of that experience than young people who have not been alive at a time when people rose up from communities and actually changed our world in a significant way. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but we're out of time. My thanks to Kathy Wilkerson for joining me. Flying Close to the Sun, My Life and Times as a Weatherman has just been published by Seven Stories Press. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.